Good morning, church. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. I know it's kind of getting cold, and yeah, it was kind of really cold this morning. But uh, if you can rise for the call to worship, I'll be reading from Psalm 145. It says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I'll praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this, uh, this season, Lord, that we can remember Christ and how he came and was born in a manger. Lord, Father, would you remind us of the greatest gift of all? Lord, for you are worthy, and there is no one like you. So we want to lift this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart Father, let your kingdom come Father, let your will be done On earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us, forgive us As we forgive the one who sinned against us Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done On earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us, forgive us As we forgive the one who sinned against us Forgive them And lead us not into temptation But deliver us from the evil one let your kingdom come it's yours it's yours all yours all yours the kingdom the power the glory are yours it's yours it's yours Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. That glorious 
morning, church, I got a little eager, but uh, let's uh, bow our heads together and pray today for our tithes and offering. Dear Lord, we, um, we just reflect and know that we come today and we worship you because you have brought hope and you have brought healing and things may be tough and um, things may be confusing at times, Lord, but we know we have hope and that you will lead us and guide us. So help us to come together and unite and proclaim that together. And in this time, we just bring our tithes and offering to you, Lord, and we give it to you so that we can expand our, 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 por- our part in your kingdom, Lord, and may it be for your your glory in Jesus name we pray amen you may have a seat and youth group you are um, free to go to your classes today so have fun uh, just a few announcements. It's so great to see everyone. We have um, Trina here who's visiting from Alabama and graduating tomorrow. So congratulations to you. And I know there's just a few of you that's been away and we're just so glad to have you back. And um, it's been a few months, a few weeks for some people. So great to have you here. We are having our Charlie Brown Christmas um, our Christmas uh, special concert next week. So please be here, bring your family and friends. It's our Christmas uh, service together. Uh, we have the Gerhards. They, so there's a newsletter that we have at church, and if you are not part of that list, we would love to have you connected. There's a letter from the Gerhards, a missionary family that we are supporting, and they've given us an update on what they're doing. We would love for you to read that. We would love for you to um, you know, understand what they're doing as we support them. So if you'd like to be a part of that newsletter and you're not part of it, please let us know so we can um, add you to that list. We have our monthly prayer meeting on Tuesday. That link comes out with that newsletter. Um, We send out another message for that Zoom link to join us for the prayer meeting. We would love to have you come. We'd love to pray for you and uh, just pray for this church. We have our traveling Tumblr photo contest. There is a uh, forms that went out so that you can vote. That voting ends on December the 13th. So please pick your favorite photo so the person can get their great gift card. Our Christmas musical and banquet that we're having next Sunday, please come and join us. We're going to be having a lot of food, so come hungry so we can eat and just, um, and we're going to have some trivia, we'll have some music, we'll have a lot of fun together. And I think, yes, and then we will be having our Christmas Eve. Christmas service? Eve service? Eve. Christmas Eve service. Um, We know a lot of people are traveling, but if you are here, we are going to be having service together. And with that, Pastor. All right. Thank you, Jen. Trina, it's so good to see you. She came all the way from Alabama to see us. So it's good to have, you know, the because many people leave to go away, but a lot of people come because this is going to be the warmest area that you will find in the country short of Florida, right? So please come um, and invite your friends and family from out of town to come. It's especially next week with our wonderful Christmas musical. Um, I don't know, are you guys in the Christmas spirit yet? Yeah. It's so funny because uh, the Kwans are, we started off Thanksgiving by watching a Christmas story and then we advanced. It's going in and out guys. Son's favorite, which is uh, Home Alone. And probably sometime before Christmas, I'll see my favorite Christmas movie, which is Die Hard. Okay. How many of you knew Die Hard is a Christmas movie? Okay, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great Christmas movie. Okay. Anyway, uh, one other thing. Uh, if you want to become a, a member of the church, uh, I'll be holding a class on the 14th or 17th of January. And right now we have six, seven people signed up. Um, and so if you have been here for over three months or over 18, you've been baptized, you're a born again believer, think that this is your church family and you want to be a part of it, just raise your hand. We'll get this clipboard to you. Anybody? I think I caught most of you already. Anyone going once, twice. Okay. We'll leave it right here. All right. All right. How are you all doing? Good. You know, now that we finished the book of Daniel, you want me to use this? The backup. Use the mic? Uh, try without. If it goes out, Okay. Those of you who actually watch online, unfortunately, we're not, we weren't able to uh, capture last week's sermon. 
um, the end of Daniel. So if you want, just call me and I will actually preach it to you in person. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, now if you finish the book of Daniel, I had an extra Sunday before official Christmas next week, the next two weeks, um, to preach on whatever I want. And guess what God laid on my heart for the last couple months? He wants me to talk about money. <laughs> now, there are several articles that came out the last few weeks that say that during the Thanksgiving season, that when you have family or mixed gatherings, you do not talk politics. Amen? Right. Because MAGA followers and climate change advocates do not mix. And it will ruin everyone's time and create a disharmonious gathering if you have a mixed group like that and talk politics. Well, in the same way, pastors are taught that we are called to preach about Jesus, right? We're called to preach about salvation, prayer, growing in the Lord. But basically, we're told as much as you can, stay away from the topic of money. The reason why? Number one, it's a sensitive subject for many of you. Uh, um, some think that the church is all about money, so talking about it just reinforces that. Number two, many feel guilty that they should give more. Oh, oh I have to multitask. Yes? Use this? Okay. Many, uh, many feel guilty. Because they know they should give more, and by talking about money in the sermon, you're reminded that you're not fulfilling the mandate to give your offerings and tithes. By the way, do you know there's a difference when it says tithes and offering? A tithe is a 10%. That's what we're called to give. But an offering is above and beyond 10%. And you're some, some of you are like, why would I want to do that? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's the second one. And the third one is this. Some of you just think it's no one else's business but me and my family or me and my spouse. And so pastors avoid talking about money so as to not offend the congregation. So with that in mind, I decided that we're not going to talk about your financial giving. This week, this Sunday, this morning, we're going to talk about financial getting. Okay? Financial getting. Now, Next week, uh, during our Christmas service, we are going to have our Christmas special, and we thank God for our own Karen Chow, who wrote this uh, Christmas, yep, a Charlie Brown Christmas, um, a play. And so it's an adaptation, and you are going to enjoy it. But maybe you didn't know that Charles Schultz also created a sequel. It's called It's Christmas Time Again, Charlie Brown. And quite frankly, if you, how many of you knew that there was a sequel? Yeah, not many. And the reason why is, quite frankly, uh, it's not as good. It, it just doesn't have that impact. But I watched it a couple weeks ago, and something came up in it that I thought was very interesting. A half-minute segue, which will show you in this scene that we learned that Christmas is not a season of giving. Christmas is a season of getting. Can you play that for us? You mean giving. Christmas is the joy of giving. I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. Giving. The only real joy is giving. Right? Wow. <laughs> That's all. Christmas is not a season of giving, friends. Christmas is a season of getting. And we laugh at the interplay between Sally and Charlie Brown because we know Christmas is supposedly the season of giving, right? The Salvation Army bell ringers remind us of that every time we go to a grocery store. But if you and I are honest, since we were able to walk... And, and as we got older, everything tells us that Christmas is about getting. The Santa Clauses and the gifts under the tree and grandparents giving us money. And the thing is, is if we get older, we learn the idea of Christmas being about giving. That's when we learn, as we get older. But that's smothered 
by every ad, by every commercial, by every pop-up that screams the exact opposite message. You deserve this. You need this to make yourself happy. Get it right now while it's on sale. And so we continue to learn that Christmas is really about getting, not giving. Before we have a white Christmas, we have to get through Black Friday. Amen? It's hard. But we're followers of Jesus Christ, right? We're supposed to be different. And I'm here to tell you that Christmas is really about getting. And I'll show you how. Three reasons why Christmas is about getting. Number one, I love having Steve back. Are you glad to be back in the service? Yeah, Steve's been gone, enjoying uh, Europe. And you know what? Steve is enjoying the season of getting because he's getting our dog for a little bit during the Christmas vacation. So thank you very much, Steve. Your reward is in heaven. All right. (laughs) Christmas is a season of getting. Number one, Christmas is about getting because what? God first gave to us, Matthew 2, 9 to 11. Now put yourself for a moment in the Christmas story, okay? Magi from the east ascertained the time and place of the birth of Christ. And knowing that it's somewhere in Palestine, they go to the local magistrate, King Herod, and ask him for directions. And you see the text up there. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented with gifts gold, incense, and myrrh. Now, you all have heard this story. I'm almost sure you have. But let me dispel three myths about these men, okay? Something that's been locked into our brain that's not true. We have that song, right? We three kings of Orient are. Guess what? They're not kings. They're magi. Magi, as in short for magic. They were astrologers. They were pagan priests. And no, they weren't necessarily three of them. We three kings? It just says magi from the east. And probably the reason why we use the word uh, three is because they brought three gifts. And finally... We always remember the scene in the Magi, right, with the Magi. They're they're presenting their gifts to little baby Jesus in the manger, and he's surrounded by angels and farm animals and maybe a little drummer boy. But Matthew 2 tells us that that wasn't the case because it says they went to the first family's home. And because Herod was willing to kill all the boys two years and under in Bethlehem, we can ascertain that maybe Jesus was up to two years old at this time. So that dispels that picture. But regardless of these so-called myths, the reality is still that the Magi came with precious gifts for the child. So what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us that Christmas is about getting, right? It seems to be about giving. Because they met, but they did. They actually did. Not only, uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of flubbed up here. They (laughs) seem to give us the example that Christmas is about giving, right? Because they came with these very expensive prophetic gifts. Because each one represented an aspect of God. The first is gold, which represents the Lord's deity. Before he was that baby, he was God in heaven in the past. The frankincense was a precious perfume speaking of the fragrance of his life and what he would live during that time. And finally, myrrh was used for embalming, which would represent his sacrificial death. So the Magi seem to show us that Christmas is about giving because they gave these incredibly precious gifts. But I tell you, it's not. It's about getting. How? Because they met and experienced the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And these pagan magicians bowed before him and worshipped him. And so that little baby gave more than they could ever give. They got eternal life. It wasn't their sacrificial gifts to him that were important. Rather, it was a sacrificial gift 
that the Son of God would give not only him, but all of us. And Jesus made it very clear throughout his ministry that money and precious gifts are so inconsequential. Remember when we went on the series on the Sermon on the Mount? You can't serve both God and money. He would say, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world, all the monetary and wealth of the world, yet forfeit your eternal soul? So no, friends, the story of the Magi makes it clear that Christmas is not about giving. Gifts, giving to one another, opening your home for gathering, serving at various charities. Don't get me wrong, those are important. But it's not about those. They should be a manifestation, when we do all those things, of the fact that God first gave to us salvation and eternal home in heaven. So first of all, Christmas, we are offered, we get eternal life. But there's a second thing that Christmas offers us. And it's this. Christmas is about getting because we obey God. Now, this year, thank God, we went through back through the basics, our theme, and many of you joined me and you read through the New Testament. Well, next year, I'm going to challenge you. If you've already finished the New Testament, good. Start to get a head start on the Old Testament. I'm going to ask you to join me uh, when you get a chance. You version app, um, and hopefully you will join us. So I want you to read through the Old Testament. That's maybe twice as long as the reading that you have in the New Testament. It's not too bad. And when you do read through the Old Testament, you're going to come across some ways that God has been faithful to people in the past. They have been recipients of his grace. They were getters. And one of those getters is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. Elisha is a prophet of God, and this incident happens. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he re revered the Lord, but now his creditors coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me what you have in your house. Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him afterward, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. What a beautiful story, huh? Unlike today, where we have government safety nets and Medicaid and Social Security and charitable organizations, a woman back at that time, when she lost her husband, she was out of luck. And in this particular case, she realized that to keep her home, those creditors would take her sons as slaves. And yeah, we're not in that kind of situation. It's a different time, a different circumstance. But in some ways, she's like us today, where some of us have no recourse with regard to our financial situation. Loss of job, market downturn, huge medical bills, ID theft, and how do we as Christ followers get on when we are in such dire need? And the answer is found in this passage. It's obedience. Remember what the prophet told him? He said, go and gather all the jars you could. Now put yourself in her place. What does that mean? It means literally that she has to go to all of her family and parents and children and relatives and neighbors and beg them for jars. But note, we try to figure out for ourselves, we don't want to do that. We test the limits of the request. Note that she didn't. She obeyed completely and gathered every jar from every source that she could. And she could have come up, quite frankly, with a number of excuses on why she didn't get those jars, right? I mean, think about it. Put yourself in her place. How about you? If you had to ask your friends and neighbors for help, how are you at doing that? Most of us, if we're very truthful, are uncomfortable with asking for help. 
It might mean needing a ride or babysitting a pet. Thank you, Steve. Or child or housing you in another town or borrowing a sturdier vehicle for tackling the snow. And if you're like most people, uh, we just don't want to do it. And I thought to myself, why? And I came up with three reasons. You probably could come up with more. Number one, it's embarrassing. I don't want to ask for help. You know, I'm self-made, and that's the whole idea of being an American. We can do it ourselves. So it's kind of embarrassing to ask for help. Number two, it's humbling. It means that someone else has to take care of your needs. And we're so proud we don't want to ask for that help. And number three, and I've heard this one a lot, well, if I get help from them, that means I owe them in return. And so the woman could have used any of these excuses, but she obeyed completely. And God uses the prophet Elisha to help this woman get. But in order for her to receive financially, she needed to obey completely. And God can bless us in the same ways, friends, if we completely obey him. But it's not partial obedience, it's complete obedience. Obedience. We move to the New Testament. An incident happens with Jesus, and he's teaching among a crowd, remember? And a rich young ruler comes and pushes his way in and begs the Lord to tell him what he needs to do to be saved. We pick up the text right here. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. And of course, this, this, this young man says, which ones? Jesus replied, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these, the young man said, I have kept since my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, that means whole, mature, Go sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Why wasn't this young man blessed, friends? Because he only partially obeyed God. He could brag that he kept five of the Ten Commandments. But he didn't keep all of them. Which five didn't he keep? The first four, all having to do with God. Put the Lord your God above. Don't use his name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. He did not honor the Lord God. He did not put God first. And there's only one of the last six that he didn't do. And it was the last one. You shall not covet. What does covet mean? It means having more and more of what you and I have enough of already. This wealthy young man had more than he needed, but he was still coveting. There was one other interesting thing that Jesus put in there. Did you catch it? The last one, and love your neighbor. That's not one of the Ten Commandments, but that's the universal command. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And so it was very interesting because the Lord only gave him three simple direct commands. Sell all your possessions. He couldn't. He could not because he was coveting. Give them to the poor. He didn't because he didn't love his neighbor. And finally, follow him. And that would have had to do with following God, loving God. And because he couldn't do the first, which was what? To give his money away. He couldn't fulfill the other two. And therefore, he walked away sad and he missed salvation. And that's why Jesus says it's so difficult for the wealthy to get into heaven. And the irony is when you and I think about the wealthy, we come up with the Jeff Bezos and and Warren Buffetts and professional athletes. Those of you who follow athletics, Shohei Otane, he got the largest contract ever in Major League Baseball. $700 million. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And so we look at them and celebrities and politicians, you know, and this isn't a dig, but all these politicians, they didn't start off as millionaires, but somehow after two, four, eight years, 10 years, they become multimillionaires. How does that happen? It's not on their salary. 
But the thing is, these people are not the wealthy, friends. They're the uber wealthy, okay? They're the ultra wealthy. And what you and I have to realize is that if you are middle class, and I went and looked it up this morning. Do you know what middle class is in America? A middle class person today makes a family, not even a single person. A middle class family today earns between fifty to $90,000. If you're upper middle class, you're from 90 to about $170,000. Most of Americans, by the world standards, are wealthy. And yet studies show that the poor of the world give a much higher percentage of their income than the wealthy. And why is that? It's because if you make $2,000 a month, it's easier to give $200 than if you make $20,000 a month and give $2,000. I don't know why, but I can tell you, I, I don't know where Shohei Otani is. He might be even a Christian, but $700 million, how much of that would be given away to charity? $70 million. How many of us think that Otani will give $70 million? Not likely. And we could look at others. We could look at the Trumps, we could look at the Obamas, all of them so say they're Christians. But if, and I did this for my son, he actually had, you know, calculate. I go, so son, if someone earns a billion dollars, how much would they tithe? He goes, uh, $10,000? Oh, come on, son, you can do about 100000 No. Million? No. $10 million? No. A billion dollars? A hundred million dollars. I guarantee you there are no billionaires that give away a hundred million dollars. They just don't. They might at the end of their life as they're giving up their wealth, but they are not giving it on a regular basis. It's hard when you're wealthy to give, but those who are of the middle and lower class proportionally give a greater amount of their income. But we're called to obey in our giving. It's called the tithe, the tenth in the Old Testament, and the offering in the New Testament. And this principle leads into our final point about Christmas being about getting. We get at Christmas because God first gave to us. We get at Christmas because we completely obey God. And thirdly, we get at Christmas because God wants to bless us. Will a person rob me? The, God says in the book of Malachi, yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you, God? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, tenth, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me on this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't even have enough room for it. You know, I remember attending a Catholic church with my cousin and was fascinated by all the rituals that happened during the service. Many of you come from a Catholic background. You know what I'm talking about. When the offering tray was passed around, my cousin gave her young daughter a dollar to put in the offering. Uh, and while we might smirk at that, I got to remember when I was eight years old and my mom gave me two quarters and I went to the Catholic church with my cousins. She said, you can keep one quarter to buy candy and the other one to put in the offering plate. And so what did I do? I kept both, okay? Okay. I said, God, I'll give you the quarter some other day. So, yeah, I can totally understand. It was something that I did myself. In any case, the dollar made my cousin or child both feel good about giving to God. But even then, when I watched, this was what I was thinking. It's just a tip. And I'm here to give you a revelation that may make you feel uncomfortable, and I'm sorry if it does, but it's the truth. Maybe you've noticed if you come to our church for any length of time, we don't pass an offering plate. We don't. So how do the lights get paid, the rent, and I get us out? How does that happen without passing the offering plate? And the reason why we don't pass an offering plate is because, number one, if you're new or here or maybe you're not a Christian or whatever, and you've been forced to come or whatever it is, we don't want to give you the idea that maybe you already thought. The church, it's all about money. And so a message on money or the offering plate going by will reinforce that. Number two, members should only give 
because they know their members and that's what they're called to do. We don't want to force individuals who are visitors and others to give. And number three is what I just said, to avoid you tipping God. Now, here's how that works. Let's say during this Christmas holiday, you take your family out for dinner, right? Could be Jin Shabu, the keg, Kai, Teppanyaki, Benihana, whatever it is. And what will happen at the end is you will either voluntarily or you want to do it, give a tip between 50, and sometimes they put it automatically in automatic 18%. 15, 18, 20, 25%, right? So on a $300 dinner, which if you've gone out to eat now, that's not outrageous. A $300 dinner means a $60 tip. And what's interesting is the idea of tipping has become quite notorious lately. Because before COVID, if you all remember, normal tipping was like 10%. And if you were incredibly generous, you might give 15. You all remember those days? But through COVID, we wanted to help these organizations and these people and the employees. And so many of us gave more, 15, 18, 20, 25% as a tip. But what happened is after COVID lockdown and now everybody's back in the restaurant, so I'm still amazed, guys, with inflation the way it is and everything, these, these high-end restaurants are packed. People are now being asked to continue to tip. And it doesn't even start at 15. It's 18% and above. And what's happened is that there's a backlash. People are getting annoyed. I'm just going to get a, a Whopper with cheese and french fries and a Coke at Burger King, and I'm being asked to give a tip, right? I mean, it's like everyone is asking for a tip, and so people are getting really annoyed. And here's how I look at it. I don't know what you tip. I don't know who you tip. And quite frankly, you can tip whatever you want to whomever you want out there who serves you. But you are not to tip God because it's a sin to tip God. What do I mean by that? The waitress helps you out with your food, right? And you give them a tip. Plumber comes by, the employee, and they help you out, you give them a little tip. But look at what God has given you. What has God given you? He's given you your education. He's given you the food on your table, ultimately. He's given you the roof over your head. Who got you that position in the company or even the company that you now own? Who helped fatten up your 401k and savings? And the answer is God, ultimately, God. So do the math. Take the income that he has given you this last year, gross or net. And God's not asking you for 15. He's not asking you for 18. He's not asking you for 20, even 25. He says a tithe, 10%. And if we're not giving to him, if instead, when you feel like it, you put $20 in the offering plate or whatever, then it's tipping God. It's sad when the waitress at, uh, you know, the keg makes more it gets more than God. And so it's a sin when the offering that we give to God is not a sacrifice, then it's just tipping God. And you and I know this to be true. So how come some, I don't know, maybe none of you, but how come some of us are not willing to tip? And by the way, tip, to tithe. And by the way, uh, the, ash, the natural... <laughs> The national average of giving in the church, all churches, is 2%. Okay? So what does that mean? There are people who are tithing, but it also means there are people who are giving nothing, right? But the average is 2%. So I'll give you the answer on why I think people are not tithing. But I'm going to do it by way of illustration. My daughter, Bethany, my oldest at the time, I don't know what. We had a jar in her nursery, right? And, and that was then when I used a lot more cash. Anytime I had coins, I threw it in that jar. After about, I think she was six, seven years old, that jar was full. Quarters, nickels, dimes. I mean, it weighed 10 pounds. It was a lot of money. And we had a missionary in our church. His name was Homer. And my daughter called him Uncle Homer. And he was going to China. And she said, Daddy, I want to take that jar and I want to give the money to Uncle Homer. I even was taken back. I go, man, we saved this for eight years. This is yours, honey. 
But she said, no, I want to give it all to Uncle Homer. And so I counted it all up, which took a lot. And I can't remember how much. It was a lot of money. For relatively speaking, for an eight-year-old, it was a lot of money. And so I have a, a picture of it, but it was great. She's standing next to Homer with this jar of money, and he just thanked her for it. That was my daughter at eight years old. If she had that jar right now at 21, and I'm talking about her, and please forgive me, daughter, for talking about you, I'm almost sure she would never give that money away. And the question is this, why was she able or wanting to give it when she was a little child and made no money and give literally all her money versus when she's older and just now starting to work and doesn't want to give up anything? And I think the reason is this, we now begin to understand the value of money and we want more and more of it and we're not willing to give it. Whereas when she was a child, who did she trust to take care of her? Us. And here's the irony of it. By her giving that jar of money, does that mean she's poor? No. Because mom and dad are taking care of her. She can give all the money she has away. She will always be taken care of because we're her parents. And by the way, this is a clincher. Because she was so generous, it made me and my wife more want to give her more. And the same principle works for God. It's funny. The more generous we are, the more we give, according to this passage, God wants to bless us. But he can only bless us, and this is why I don't like holding the microphone, he can only bless us because we have our hands open to him. But if our hands are closed, right? If our hands are closed, he can't put anything in them. So the question is, do we go to God with our hands open? And so I learned this lesson as a baby Christian. I became a Christian at 21 years old. And that was also the year I graduated from college, 1982. And it started with a salary of $18,000. You're like, wow, that's nothing. Yeah, well, this is 1982, okay? I was a, a, a trainee. And, and God took care of me during my career. This was before automated tellers and, and automatic payments, uh, you know, deposits and everything. And I remember I get twice monthly checks. I just, they gathered up on my dresser because I didn't need the money. God was taking care of me. You know, I didn't even need that much money. And I remember at that time hearing the idea of a tithe. And, you know, I'm pretty good at math. If I make $18,000, how much is that per month in a tithe? Oh, come on. You guys are smarter than that. $150. Well, I never gave anything to God before. So I said to myself, well, $150 is a lot of money. So here's God what I'm going to do. I was working this out with God. I'm going to start God with $50 a month, okay? And... I'm going to raise it $10 a month, God, until I hit the tithe. Is that okay with you? It doesn't matter what you think. That's what I'm going to do. And so I was faithful to God to give 10 more dollars. If you do the math, that means that within less than a year, I should have reached the tithe, right? I didn't. Why? Because as I faithfully said, I will help you. I will help you, God. I will give to you, God. I got a promotion. And then I got a raise. And then I went through evaluations, and the, the company gives a rating of one to five. Only 5% 5 of employees get a five every year. And I'm thankful. I got two fives in a row, which meant my salary bumped up. It took a long time before I hit the tithe. And then at that point, I realized, God, I'm going to keep giving. Then what happened? God calls me into ministry. I go part-time in my job as a senior financial analyst. And so I said, God, I'm not cutting back my tithe. And I kept giving the same amount, even though it wasn't a tithe anymore. And then God opened up an opportunity to buy a home. Well, I found out with my salary, uh, the mortgage would be 40% of my gross. So that left essentially about enough money for top ramen every night, if I kept up my tithe. And I said, God, you gave me this home. I'm not cutting back. Um, what happened within the next six months? 
I got a promotion at work. They started paying interns at my church. I got a roommate, and all of a sudden, what was a really hard thing to make, that mortgage became less than a third of my income. And so God continued to bless me. And then I moved here in 1993, continued to do what God wanted. I got married to Kathy, and we definitely made more money. We kicked up our tithe and offerings, and then we kept continuing to give more and more. Then Kathy went to part-time a year and a half ago, and we told God we're not coming back. So it's not just the tithe anymore. And here's the deal. And I'm sharing this by way of testimony, not how great I am, just showing how faithful God is. Here's the cool thing. We give more. And some of you might say, well, don't you have kids that have to go through school? Yeah. Don't you have medical benefits? You don't have medical insurance? Yeah. I'm going to trust God. He said he will be faithful and will give when we need to give. So we will continue to give more and more because that's what God wants me to do. And I believe that God will bless us. Now, I want to say one thing about this. Not all of you here are called to tithe, okay? There are some of you right now who are struggling financially. Some of you lost your job, and you're just trying to stay out of poverty, and, and you, you can barely pay even your bills now if not. I had a girlfriend way back in my 20s, and she didn't make a lot of money. And I found out that for the tithe, she was using a credit card. I said, why? She goes, I'm not making enough to make ends meet. I said, don't use the credit card. You know, God doesn't want you to give out of your poverty that way. You can, ser- you can give to God in other ways, but don't, don't put your tithe on a credit card. And by the way, she was supporting, you know, children and whatever, and she supported a child all the way to 18 years old, Christian uh, organization. And so if you're in that boat, if anything, you are not supposed to give. We who have an abundance should be giving to you. So please, in humility, ask for help, because we're here to help you. Now, I have a handout. Ryan's got it right here. It's a budget sheet. And if you look at this budget sheet, um, you can get an online soft copy, but I have a hard copy for those of you who don't like to to print out stuff. Ryan and and Lydia here, if you want a hard copy, just raise your hand and they'll pass it out to you. Anybody? Hard copy? I didn't want to kill a lot of trees, but if you want a hard copy, you can take a look at it. Notice what it says at the top, gross income. And the next line after that is tithe, 10% of your gross income. If you can't handle it, you know, net income, if you still are like me and you want to start off even $50, whatever it is you want to commit, it's not just by chance what you give to God. You actually intend to do it, put it down. After you put that tithe, your expected federal taxes, expected state and local taxes, medical, dental, insurance, others, and total it up. And that is your net income income. Then when you go down from them, you're going to see what we call our um, down, um, fixed expenses, your rent, your mortgage, stuff like that. And you put those in, insurance and everything. Put that all in. Then you have what we have, what we call discretionary expenses. Those are not fixed. You can cut back the amount of food you eat. You can cut back the amount of recreation and, and holidays and vacation. And after all is said and done, you net it out, and whatever it is, if it's in the black, and God willing, it's in the black, that's your savings. That's what you can put away. But see, if you have your tithe in there, and you still have savings, I guarantee you God will give you even more than you asked for. How do I know? Because that's what he was saying to the rich young ruler after he left. He didn't hear these words, but this is what he said. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom will fail to receive many times as much in this age, right now, and in the age to come, eternal life. So guys, Christmas is not about giving. It's about getting. And I guarantee you, God will give you more the more you give back to him and others. Let's pray. Father, um, as we share 
how much you have blessed us. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to be a blessing to others, to our church, to those who are in need, to just be thoughtful and care. Not because, Lord, we feel guilty, but because that's what you want and desire of us. And as we do that, Lord, I know we'll get, because your word promises we'll get. And maybe it seems selfish to think like that, but Lord, we just thank you that you are a heavenly father who says, I love my children, and I want to give them and lavish on them all of my blessings. And how many of us, Lord, who have accepted Lord Jesus Christ would not say our eternal salvation is worth whatever we're willing to give? So I pray, Lord, that we would be more generous people, not only with our finances, but with our time and our abilities to be a blessing, to be salt and light in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, please stand if you're able. give as a family, it should be something in agreement between the husband and wife. You don't want to cause discord, okay? So discuss it among uh, yourselves before you give. All right? Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, we know that you will more than take care of our church, Lord, and the finances. But I pray that everyone would see the blessing of serving you, of loving you, of praising you, and yes, giving to you. We just thank you, Lord, for this time. Be with us as we fellowship together later. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day in the Lord. You got to come back next week. Bring your families and friends. The kids are awful cute. And it's only a 10-minute sermon next week, okay? So you got to come for that one, too. All right. Let's go meet in the cafeteria and enjoy each other's company. <laughs>